If you're looking to learn how to negotiate a real estate deal like a real estate investor, there's a certain way to do it, to open up your possibilities to creative financing. And if you get this wrong, you're gonna negotiate like most people and, and, and focus solely on the price, which leaves opportunity and money on the table. And with every transaction, it's gonna result in you got, a, you got a winner and you got a loser. When you do it right though, you add terms to the negotiation, of which creates unlimited possibilities. You close more deals, you make more money, you build massive wealth, and the greater the likelihood of both sides getting what they want out of any given deal. Now, I'm gonna show you how, but before we begin, click the subscribe button and ring the notification bell because I post cool stuff like this each and every week and you don't wanna miss it. Let's go. Hi, my name is Matt Terrio. I am CEO of Epic Real Estate, and this is where we show people how to invest in real estate with an emphasis on retiring early. And that can happen quickly when you consistently find great off-market deals, of which are frequently the result of a successful negotiation. And when you introduce simple creative financing strategies into the negotiations, it can happen even faster. Now, last session, I walked you through property evaluation to help you form your own initial opinion of value. And you can find the links below for the entire series on how to negotiate a real estate deal. Now that you've got your initial opinion of value, it's time to put together your offer and do it quickly because you don't wanna lose out to another buyer. I mean, it can be competitive out there and it typically is, but you can easily beat your competition by instilling some urgency into your process. And here's what I mean. Let's imagine there was an auction coming up for the Mona Lisa and there are two auction houses competing for the privilege to auction the painting as the commissions for the auction house are sure to be significant. Auction house A has been in the business for generations. They have a prestigious reputation and abundance of experience and an enormous customer list and a bottomless marketing budget. And whenever they want to, they can pack the auction house with ready, willing and able buyers. And for the Mona Lisa, they most certainly will. Now, auction house B, they just got their business license. They just opened up their doors and the Mona Lisa will be their very first item that they've ever auctioned. And because of their lack of experience, lack of name recognition and lack of a marketing budget, they'll be lucky to get just one buyer in the room. As the seller of the Mona Lisa, you most certainly are going to hire auction house A for the job because the more buyers in the room, the higher the sales price is likely to be. But if you're a buyer, you're hoping auction house B gets the job because there's no competition there and that's likely to create a discounted purchase, especially if the seller needs the money. So what does this have to do with negotiating a real estate deal? Well, as the buyer, before you're in contract, you're sitting in auction house A. Once you put a property in contract, you're in auction house B and you've locked the door so that no other buyers can get in. You want to get control of the auction house and you want to lock the door behind you as soon as possible so that no one else can get in. And in real estate, that happens as a result of having a signed contract with the seller. So move quickly with your offer to get control of the deal. And don't let the quickly part of this process concern you. And here's why. The way that a real estate purchase agreement is written, the buyer, you in this instance, has the legal right to inspect a property prior to officially bringing your money to the closing table. Should you discover anything during the inspection that impacts the value of the property to be something different than what the contract price is, you have the right to renegotiate the price or walk away from the deal without penalty. It's the contingency clauses in the contract that allow you to legally do this. So I bring this up because most buyers will conduct a great deal of their property investigation, like analyzing the neighborhood and the condition of the property, and they're gonna be looking for the money, they're gonna be crunching the numbers before they're in contract. All the while, another buyer just kind of swoops in and steals the deal right out from under them. So you've now wasted your time doing all of that work for nothing, and now have to go out and find another deal, where you'll start the process all over again with another property. And this can be a very frustrating way to go about your business, so don't do that. Rather, do some quick and dirty math. It's not a complicated formula, and I'll show you how in just a second, but put together your offer with a price somewhere just in the ballpark of what you need to achieve your desired outcome, and then present it to the seller, contingent on your inspection. Get into contract as quickly as you can based on the general information that you find and what the seller shares with you. That'll get you in the ballpark, 
and get you control of the property. And then begin your thorough inspection and dig into the details to confirm your quick and dirty numbers. If you discover something that invalidates your offer, you can bring that up to the seller when you do and either cancel, renegotiate, or proceed. That's what you want to do. Now here's how you do it. First, your mindset as a real estate investor. You buy property in one of two ways, by either your price in the seller's terms or the seller's price in your terms. As long as you can control one, the price or the terms, you can always create a deal for yourself. Second, formulate your quick and dirty math cash price because most sellers, they, they think and speak in terms of price. So that's typically the path of least resistance when you can speak their language. And that quick and dirty math, it looks like this. You've got ARV times 70%, less repairs, less profit equals your maximum allowable offer. Now you might've seen this before. I'm not the only one that teaches it this way, but I am the only one that I know of that adds these caveats. And it's crucial depending on your market. ARV stands for after repair value. And the 70% number that you see here, this represents the amount of money you're leaving in the deal for your buyer if you were to flip it. In the instance that you want to quickly sell the property or assign your contract, your most likely buyer will be another investor. And like you, they are in the business of making money. So they aren't going to buy your deal if they can't make money. So you have to leave money in the deal for them. That's what this number represents but this number isn't universally applicable. It's a sliding scale really, and it's not an exact science either, but as a rule of thumb, the 70% works for price points of ARVs of $200,000-ish and less. You're gonna wanna bump this up to 75% for ARVs between say 200 and 400, 80% of ARVs between say 400 and 600, and 85% of ARV of 600 and above. Again, this isn't an exact science. You're gonna find plenty of gray area in between each price point, but it's a decent guide for your quick and dirty math. Next, right here, repairs. And calculating them, that's not an exact science either, but also has a rule of thumb to follow. And I do it like this. I break down my repair assessments as either light, medium, or heavy. So for the light, I calculate it for $10 per square foot. For medium, I calculate $15 per square foot, and for heavy, $20 or sometimes even more per square foot. There's plenty of gray area in here too, but not vital at this point. As long as you just keep in mind that this isn't a calculation to rehab the property to pristine retail condition, but rather for what I call a rent ready rehab. To make sure, you know, just everything works, everything is safe, it's all up to code and everything is clean. The last part, this is your profit. Now you get to choose what you want to make. So whatever you do choose, just bump it up a little bit just to leave some room for negotiating, either being with the seller or the buyer later on. So with numbers, your quick and dirty math would look something like this. $100,000 times 70% equals $70,000, less a light rehab at $10 per square foot on a 1,500 square foot house, so that's $15,000, less $7,500 as your profit, that gives you a maximum allowable offer of $47,500. Before moving forward with this number though, one thing that I like to do is just to make sure that if I happen to get stuck with this property, if I'm unable to flip it, I wanna make sure that I'll at least cash flow. So I use the 1% rule to quickly confirm. And that's just confirming that the monthly gross rent is gonna be greater than 1% of the acquisition and repair cost. So based on this, it checks out. This maximum allowable offer number represents the ballpark for me. When I'm negotiating with the seller, this is the general number that I'm looking to get into contract with to lock the door to my auction house so that no other buyers can get in. And then I can evaluate my Mona Lisa for its condition, its flaws, and its authenticity without the fear of someone snatching it out from under me. Now, if the seller frowns at my cash price, then I can offer them more but with terms attached. And price and terms, they work in conjunction with each other like this. You know, right here, we've got our cash discounted price with $47,500 being the price, the fast cash being the terms. So if the seller wants a higher price, no problem. But we also have to modify the fast cash to slow or slower cash. So the higher the price, the longer I get to pay. That's the basic concept. Now it can get much more sophisticated than that, and it will by incorporating terms like these in the length and manner of which you'll pay the seller's higher price. Like making payments to the seller, how those payments are amortized, interest rates, down payments, balloon payments, moratoriums, profit sharing. I mean, the possibilities are endless when you incorporate terms like these into your offers. If you'd like a list of these terms and 10 examples of creative deal structures, you can download the same ones that I give to my private clients at epicbreakthrough.com. 
for free. Now that you've got an idea as to what you're going to present to the seller, it's almost an art form to actually getting them to sign the agreement. So meet me in the next session and I'll walk you through the science of lead conversion of where I'll give you the secrets to becoming a rapport building, deal creating ninja or artist, if you will. But before you go there, what have you found most impactful so far? I mean, what'd you notice? What'd you learn? Let me know in the comments below. And who do you know that may also find this valuable? When their name comes to mind, please share this with them. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.